All right, we're back for round two. Ty and Kale, I'm the Canada. He's our tech director, and this is uh, our inaugural, whatever we call it, kitchen cabinet uh, campaign 2020. I'm the candidate running in the U- in Utah's second congressional district as a Democrat. Uh, we're grateful you're spending time with us. So I had started with the campaign update, a little bit about each of us. Now I want to <clears throat> shift to the issue that we're all focused on, and that's this virus, COVID, uh, COVID-19. Being in a place like Fallujah for three years or in the eastern edge of Afghanistan where Osama bin Laden used to live representing our country, what I learned um, in my role in all those places was pretty straightforward and and pretty um, important. Uh, Bad policy, incompetence in government gets people killed. Um, But what I saw in my job working with Marines of all ranks, whether they were corporals, captains, colonels, or all the way up to three and now four-star generals, is that when our our government fails um, at a policy level, at a preparation level, at a wisdom level, uh, people get killed. Marines get killed, soldiers get killed, Iraqi civilians get killed. Fast forward to today. Um, None of us want to be where we are. Um, but I think we need to think hard about how we got here. What this COVID virus, I think, has shown is that this is a similar situation that I tried to get to in my book, which is if we don't have big people and big jobs with a lot of experience and wisdom, and I think a lot of good judgment, uh, people can die. And it tears us all up to see the images of uh, body bags um, in our in our cities. I was a living in New York for almost four years when I represented our our country at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. And I look at those images from another, quote, hometown I used to live in, and I think, how did we get here? Well, I know how partly we got here, which is we have the wrong people in government. Um, we've got people, I think, that treat governing as a game. I think that we've got people that view the red and blue divide as something to be encouraged I think, yes, and I'll name Mr. Stewart, someone who has put um, himself and one president over the interests of the United States of America. But the net effect of that is, is failed policy gets people hurt, it gets people killed. And that's a theme I'm going to continue to come back to. So I want to shift to where I think the failures have become very uh, apparent and dramatic. Um, and it's pretty much apparent to all of us uh, every day of the week right now and why we're doing this rather than talking to you in person. So Mr. Stewart is the current office holder, uh, second congressional district. I've never met him. Um, I hope I have that opportunity. And of course, there's a reason why I'm running. I don't think he's doing a good job. I think he's failed many Utahns, if not all of us. And I think he has put self-interest and party interest over the interests of our country. And I don't say that as a political person. I say that as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about policy challenges and how to fix challenges, how to find better solutions. I write about being in Helmand or Fallujah, and my job in those wars was to work with mayors and governors, Iraqi mayors, Afghan mayors, to be working with Marines after the biggest battle of the Iraq war in Fallujah when half the city was leveled. Think about it, half of a city of about half a million people was leveled. I walk in with Marines and we're charged with rebuilding that city. Infrastructure, sewer lines, power lines, water, city councils, finding Iraqis to come work with us. So I've I've had a lot of um, tough challenges in my prior career so he's had a couple of tele-town halls. Um, I listened to the first one. Um, I'm grateful that he did it. Um, I think it's important that he at least tried to reach out again, but that doesn't excuse what follows. And what followed, I felt like, uh, was a lot of excuse making, a lot of, again, putting party over, I think, uh, policy or solutions. But the one I want to focus on is the one that was held on Thursday night, so just a few nights ago. And Ty was there, and John Zaccio, my 92-year-old Rotarian friend, soon to be 93, uh, was on the call as well. Ironically enough, I was the first person they went to. 
I then added two more questions. Um, the second question was probably, in my view, um, the one that I really wanted to ask, which is, did he support a 9-11 style commission to look at what went wrong? How did we get to the point where our doctors and nurses don't have PPE, they don't have masks, they don't have gowns? And then the third question I asked was whether he supported uh, the President uh, Trump using the uh, Defense Production Act, and those are the three. The one I want to focus on um, in the time that we've got is based on a very good article that came out the day after this Teletown Hall. And I want to thank Dennis Romboy, who wrote the piece, because when I saw it, it's titled Representative Chris Stewart Backs COVID-19 Commission, and then here's the kicker. As long as goal isn't to embarrass President Trump. So, well, guess who asked that question that got to the, I'm sure the people had it too. So I'm just going to read, read how the article starts. Dateline Salt Lake City. Representative Chris Stewart would favor a 9-11 style commission to look at how prepared the United States was to handle a pandemic. As long as it doesn't set out to embarrass President Donald Trump. Also, the Utah Republican said he worries that ongoing government-imposed social distancing restrictions could make socialism more acceptable to the country. Stewart said he would not support a review trying to blame someone for the U.S. response to the coronavirus outbreak. Most government agencies, he said, have done an extraordinary, though not perfect, job. That's ironic because Chris Stewart for a long time has attacked government left and right, up and down. We'll talk more, more about that. And then this is Stewart's words. Quote, but if this is just an effort to try to diminish or embarrass the president or some of the other people that are working around him that I think generally are doing an outstanding job, I don't think that's helpful at all. The article goes on. Well, we sure are criticizing for all the right reasons. I then want to just highlight a few comments that Utahns had put on the website because I think they speak very directly and eloquently about what Mr. Stewart seems to be trying to do, which is to say, we don't want accountability, especially if it embarrasses the president. So these are the comments I want to highlight, and pardon me if I read a bit more, but, I, but these really stood out to me. The first begins, Mr. Stewart should be more concerned about getting to the truth than trying to protect the president from embarrassment should it be determined it is deserved. It is unfortunate that during a national crisis we are still being given information from the top that is not always accurate. A case can be made that had the president reacted to the situation from the onset instead of downplaying and denying it that the crisis in the U.S. would not be as severe as it is, although it would still be serious. It is most fortunate that we have Drs. Fauci and Burks there. Hopefully, Mr. Trump will continue to allow them to do the excellent job they are doing. At the current time, we need to stick together as a nation during this most difficult episode in our history. Whether we approve or not of Mr. Trump, unity is of paramount importance at this time. Those who disapprove of the performance of any elected official will be able formally to express that this coming November. There's another one. Stewart seems to be concerned about a lot here, protecting Trump's reputation, not encouraging socialism, protecting state sovereignty of states that are not protecting their citizens and not getting Americans used to the idea that the government will save them during a national crisis. Leadership equals vision. Why is his vision focused on everything but saving human lives? That's what every response in this interview should have been about. How do we save more lives? It's not his positions that are the problem, it's his priorities. Stop talking politics, get to work saving lives. A third one. I think Representative Stewart misses the mark on this one by saying it shouldn't embarrass Trump. Trump has made some big mistakes in responding and planning for the threat of COVID-19. Trump should be held accountable for his inaction and refusal 
of the WHO and the World Health Organization test in February without finger pointing at the usual targets. People will not forget the mistakes Trump has made when we go to the polls to elect our next president. Now, the, the last comment from a, a Utah uh, following uh, Chris Stewart's Teletown Hall, uh, maybe actually two more, um, is protecting Donald Trump from embarrassment really more important than discovering the truth and finding solutions and even pointing out our mistakes or missteps so we can do better? By the way, narcissists don't get embarrassed. They retaliate. And then the last one from Fisher Smith, time to get rid of Chris Stewart. So I could have, have listed more and I could tell you more about what I think, but I wanted to give voice to, to you Utahns who took time to get online and, and respond to a, a, a story that was based on a teletown hall. But, but what the Stuart Teletown Hall, I think, really demonstrated is unfortunate. I don't like to highlight failure in our leaders. Um, I don't like to think about how public policy has failed to the point that people die. That said, comma, it's incumbent, I think, on all of us to hold our elected officials accountable when they fail or when they seem to do their job not about representing us, but about protecting the leader of their party. Now, I think, given everything that's going on, it's kind of important that we have serious people and serious jobs. And of course, what's more serious than trying to find solutions to a global pandemic that's gonna kill more people and unnecessarily kill people that probably wouldn't have been killed if we had been more on top of what our elected officials are paid to do. Our elected officials are paid to make sure our national stockpile is not low, that it's high. Um, they're paid to think about worst case scenarios, not best case scenarios only. What a place like Fallujah and what these wars taught me over seven years is that the veneer of civilization is very thin. And the only thing that gets us through that is how we treat each other when the law may not be there to protect you. It's based on how you protect each other. When I uh, was younger, um, didn't have any gray hair at the time, I would go into the meetings with the Iraqi and Afghan leaders with a, with a green notebook, you know, that's issued by the military. And, you know, you'd, you'd pull it out and take notes, and eventually the Iraqis and the Afghans would say, oh, you're, you're another American, pulling out your notebook, taking notes, and then you leave, and that's all we, that's all we ever get is, you know, scribbles and silence. And eventually I said, what I'm going to tell you, and I'm very serious about this as a serious person, um, I used to say to them, whether they were the governors or the mayors or the religious leaders or the tribal leaders, I always keep the promises I make, which is why I don't make very many. I always keep the promises I make, which is why I don't make very many. And it's actually a good policy, not just in a war zone, but it's a good policy in life. Um, so when I make a promise, I keep it. And the promise I'll make to you, I promise you I'll treat this job seriously and that I'll never forget that I work for you. And I'll make a promise April 4th, is it Saturday, April 4th, today, that if I fail in that, and if I get the nomination and I'm lucky enough to, to win, if I fail in that, you should fire me. Fire me in two years. So that's, that's the promise I'll make. I'll probably make one or two more, but you don't get a lot of promises from me because I always keep the ones I make. And I think it's important that we get leaders who understand that. This is about that bond, I think, and I'll, I'll end with this. This is about the bond, I think, that we, we need between each other as neighbors. We need to be better neighbors because right now being better neighbors is how we're surviving. Um, our government's trying to do its best to, to help us get back on our, our feet. Um, but if we can help each other, uh, maybe at the end of this, we'll, we'll be a better community. We'll be a community that isn't about building walls, but about building bridges. It will be a community uh, that isn't red and blue America. We'll be a community that will say, I'm not going to use fear to divide people. People are genuinely afraid right now, and we understand that. But to use fear to divide people, in my view, is wrong. It's what gets us to the point where our government fails.
this campaign is only possible with donations, whether it's 20 bucks or for some people, and we've had generous donors who have donated all the way up to 2,800. Um, I hate to ask for it. I hate to dial for dollars. But if you are so inclined to invest, you can go to westonforcongress.com. There's a link there, uh, donate button. Uh, you can reach me directly at K-A-E-L at westonforcongress.com. So thank you. That was kind of fun. Yeah. I don't know how we did. Uh, we'll get better at it.